Hello and welcome to a video summarising Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's novella The Sign of the Four. In this video, I will walk you through the story's narrative structure and I'll summarise each chapter of this novella, highlighting key quotes to memorise for every single chapter. This video is especially useful as you'll get a broad overview of the novella, but also if you're studying this text on a last minute basis for your coursework or exams, then you'll find the summary gets straight to the heart of all the events in the novella. Do bear in mind that we have an in-depth Sign of the Four course that covers everything including context, plot and structure, themes, characters and Conan Doyle's use of language and most importantly you will get access to top level 9 multiple answers and you will learn how to write top responses for your coursework or exams. So let's get started. Now when it comes to the narrative framework of this novella, one thing to bear in mind is a striking feature of the Sign of the Four as well as other Sherlock Holmes stories, is the use of Watson as the first person narrator. Now, many novelists, especially at the time, such as Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice, used omniscient narrators who are not characters in the novel, but instead are written in the third person by an unnamed narrator, providing an all-knowing, all-seeing point of view and able to comment on the thoughts and actions of many characters. Other novelists, however, use first person narrator who are the main characters or protagonists in novels, such as Charles Dickens' use of Pip in Great Expectations, and this allows us as readers to follow the tale completely through the point of view of one main character. Now, in this novella, Conan Doyle does employ first-person narrator, but instead of seeing the story from Sherlock Holmes's point of view, we see the mystery from the perspective of his devoted follower, Watson. Now, this was done to sustain suspense in the stories, as Holmes's thoughts are not always revealed to us as they occur. If we as readers arrived at solutions as quickly as the protagonist Sherlock Holmes does, then the novel then lacks mystery and it can end very abruptly. However, with Watson as our narrator, we trace the plot in the same way as a reasonably intelligent and sensible person might, but without Sherlock Holmes's rapid genius. So this has led many critics to believe that Watson serves as a proxy for us as readers and we're able to marvel at Sherlock Holmes's talents in a similar way to him. Also, during the age of realism, Watson provides an excuse for writing the tales by explaining that he's written about previous adventures for publication and he makes clear in the narrative that he's recounting something that happened in the past while occasionally referring to the present, such as his wife reminding him of what happened on the trip to the Lyceum Theatre. And what this does is it does to some degree remove a sense of suspense as it reveals that both Watson and Mary will survive this encounter and later they will be together. Now when it comes to the structure of this novella, do bear in mind that this is detective fiction and thus detective fiction must involve crime or mystery that needs to be solved but unlike other mysteries the initial focus is usually on the detective. Now this story often begins with Holmes and Watson in Baker Street with Watson offering an admiring and sometimes exasperated description of Sherlock Holmes and his remarkable ability which serves as the novel's initial exposition. Next, structurally speaking, a client arrives presenting a crime or mystery that must be sufficiently interesting for Sherlock Holmes as well as us and this provides what we call a catalyst for the subsequent actions. A series of puzzling clues, such as for instance the mysterious sign of four notes is presented and there must be obstacles or complications that prevent a quick and straightforward solution, such as a murder within a locked room. And then an exciting climax is needed, which may involve chasing and trapping the criminal, followed by a full confession of the criminal, which serves as a novel's denouement, the end. And so of course this story follows this typical structure of detective fiction. However, do bear in mind, structurally speaking, that there is is a subplot. So alongside the main plot of the mystery in this story, there's a subplot of romance between Watson and Mary. So although many fewer words are spent on this subplot by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle than the mystery, this subplot still provides a vital counterpoint to the main story and it reveals the differences between the characters of Sherlock Holmes and Watson. So over the course of the novel, Watson is immediately attracted to Mary. He grows to admire her. He has his hopes dashed by the prospect of her inheritance and then Upon learning that the treasure has vanished, he proposes to her. And the last chapter ends with Watson's happy announcement of his impending marriage, contrasting with Holmes's slipping back into a somewhat dark depression. So now let's look at the plot in a nutshell, beginning with chapter one. 
So, the chapter called The Science of Deduction begins with Dr. Watson, the novel's narrator who bemoans Sherlock Holmes's tendency to indulge in artificial stimulants, and in this case, cocaine. Holmes says he craves mental exaltations and is often bored because he doesn't currently have a case for detection and he proudly explains his position as world's only unofficial consulting detective, helping out the professionals when they are out of their depth. And as a challenge, Dr. Watson hands him a watch and asks him to deduce who this owner is and Holmes correctly reads the clues in the watch and announces that it belonged to Watson's unfortunate deceased brother. And the chapter ends with the announcement that a young woman has arrived and wants to see Holmes. Now, in terms of key quotes to remember from this chapter, the big first one would be, but I abhor the dull routine of existence. I crave for mental exaltation. And of course, this is Sherlock Holmes talking about why he takes drugs. Also, he talks about being an unofficial consultant detective. Also, eliminate all other factors and the one which remains must be the truth. This is the process of deduction. And finally, I'd forgotten how personal and painful a thing might be to you. This is when he talks very dispassionately about this watch and Watson's brother. Now, in chapter two, which is the statement of the case, the mysterious lady is Miss Mary Morst, and she's a 26-year-old governess who enters Holmes's room and explains the baffling case of her father. So he'd been an officer in an Indian regiment and, after her mother's death, had placed Miss Morston in a boarding school. Ten years ago, when she was 17, he returned to England and asked her to meet him at the Langham Hotel in London, but he disappeared mysteriously before they were reunited. She contacted her father's closest friend, Major Sholto, who claimed not to know that her father was in England, and after answering an advertisement request, Requesting her dress, she had, for the past six years upon the same date, received a box containing a single rare pearl. To add to the mystery, on that morning she received a letter saying she was a wronged woman and this letter asked her to come to the Lyceum Theatre and advise her that she could bring two friends and of course Holmes and Watson agreed to accompany her to this meeting. And the quotations to remember from this chapter are, you really are an automaton, this is Watson describing Holmes. A client to me is a mere unit, this is Sherlock Holmes talking about his perspective on clients and the description of Mary Morrison as a very attractive woman. Chapter 3, which is titled In Quest of a Solution, shows Holmes, who's discovered that Major Sholto, the late Captain Morstan's friend, passed away six years ago. Holmes believes that Sholto's heir must know something about the mystery and perhaps is hoping to compensate Miss Mary Morstan. They're set off for the meeting at the Lyceum Theatre and Miss Morstan shows Holmes a curious paper which she's discovered in her late father's belongings and this paper has a diagram with various notations including a curious hieroglyphic of four crosses and the phrase of the son of the four along with four names. At the theatre they're then met by a man who ushers them into a carriage, drives into a terraced house in the southern suburbs of London, an Asian servant answers the door and a voice from within asks that they be shown in. And the quotations from this a chapter is curious paper there was something airy and ghost-like in the endless process of faces which flitted across these narrow bars of light this is describing the airy images that they see as they go through london in the darkness and we were driving to an unknown place on an unknown errand now chapter four which is titled the story of the bald-headed man now there's a bald-headed man of the chapter who we learn is Thaddeus Sholto, one of Major Sholto's sons and he's actually the first half of two twins Bartholomew Sholto being his other twin He's an eccentric character who has turned his outwardly ordinary house into a luxurious and exotic apartment. He explains that his father returned from India, a very wealthy man, but he was also fearful of being attacked and frightened by men with wooden legs to the point of paranoia. On his deathbed, he confessed that he and Captain Morstan had argued over the division of the treasure from India and that Morstan had died suddenly of a heart attack. Fearing that he'd be accused of murder, Major Sholto and his manservant hid Captain Morstan's body and deprived Miss Morstan of her inheritance. And regretting this, Major Sholto wanted his twin sons, Thaddeus and Bartholomew, to make reparation. But just as he was going to reveal the location for the rest of the treasure, he was startled by a mysterious face at the window and suddenly died. And Thaddeus arranged for the pearls to be sent to Miss Morstan as a small reparation. But now Bartholomew has discovered the rest of the treasure. And Thaddeus arranged for them to all travel to Pondy Cherry Lodge to demand Miss Morstan's share, which would make her a wealthy heiress. Now, the key quotations from this chapter are, In that sorry house, it looked as out of place as a diamond of the first water in a setting of brass to describe uh, Thaddeus Sholto's home. The cursed greed, which has been my besetting sin, and it was a bearded, hairy face with wild eyes, describing the Deus Shelter's appearance. Chapter 5, 
called the tragedy of Pondicherry Lodge. Now, upon arriving at Pondicherry Lodge, there's signs that the grounds were dug up by Bartholomew when looking for the treasure. The housekeeper, Mrs. Burnstone, is heard crying. She then explains that Bartholomew had locked himself in his room and wouldn't answer her. Holmes and Watson then break down the door and discover that Bartholomew is dead and on the table near the dead man is a mysterious hammer-like object and a piece of paper with the sign of the four on it and stuck near the dead man's ear is something that looks like a thorn and Thaddeus notices that the treasure is missing and Holmes sends him off to report the crime to the police and the quotations for this chapter are the vast size of the building where this gloom and its deathly silence struck a chill to the heart. Also, a wondrous subtle thing is love and the features were set in a horrible smile, a fixed and unnatural grin to describe Bartholomew's dead body. Chapter 6 called Sherlock Holmes gives a demonstration. Here we see Holmes examining the room and discovering that two people must have committed the murder. A man with a wooden leg would have entered through the window using a rope thrown down by the second person who entered through a hole in the roof. The footprints of the second person were unusually small like those of a child. The dead man is thought to have been poisoned by the thorn, which is actually a poisoned dart that was found on his head. Anthony Jones, a police detective, arrives. He comes to a number of false conclusions and is intent on arresting Thaddeus for the murder of his brother. Holmes says that he can clear Thaddeus's names as well as Jonathan Small, who he names as the wooden-legged ex-convict who had been in the room the previous evening. And he asks Watson to escort Miss Mary Morstan to her home and then bring back Toby, a dog with a good scent and a good way of finding convicts. The key quotations to remember are, you see that I'm weaving my web around Thaddeus. This is what Bethany Jones says when he's mistakenly assuming that Thaddeus killed his brother. I shall study the great Jones's method. This is sarcasm on Holmes's part describing Anthony Jones and the most amazing power of scent. Chapter 7 is called The Episode of the Barrel. Now, after returning Miss Morstan to her home, Watson borrows Toby the dog and returns to Pondicherry Lodge. The police detective, Jones, has arrested not only Thaddeus but most other members of the household, giving Watson and Holmes the opportunity to explore the area and possible escape routes for the murderers. Toby smells the creosote that one of the murderers stepped in and they follow the dog's lead throughout the night as he chases the scent across much of South London. During this journey, Holmes explains how he knew so much about Jonathan Small, who's the wooden-legged ex-convict they're pursuing along with his mysterious companion, and after some indecision, Toby leads them to a large barrel full of creosote. Now, the key quotations to remember from this chapter are how small we feel with our petty ambitions and strivings in the presence of the great elemental forces of nature, and Toby seems to advance but began to run backward and forward, the very picture of canine indecision, of course describing Toby the dog who's trying to decipher these smells. Chapter 8 is called The Baker Street Irregulars. Now, retracing their steps, they once again pick up the trail of the suspects but find it leads them to a riverside landing stage where boats are available for hire. Sherlock Holmes tricks the wife of the owner of one of the boats to reveal that a wooden-legged man has been associating with her husband, Mordecai Smith, and that they are on a steamboat called the Aurora. Returning to Baker Street, Holmes and Watson read a newspaper article which praises police detective Jones's single and vigorous masterful mind and his handling of the case. And the Baker Street Irregulars, a noisy group of street urchins employed by Holmes, arrive and he orders them to find the Aurora. Holmes reveals that he knows about Jonathan Small's companion, who is an aborigine from the Andaman Islands, and the quotations from this chapter are a swift pattering of naked feet upon the stairs, a clatter of high voices. This, of course, describes these Baker Street irregulars and pay attention to the onomatopoeia that's used. Also, that describes as rugged little street Arabs and great agility small poison darts. Chapter 9 is titled A Break in the Chain. So in this chapter, Watson returns Toby to his owner and goes to see Miss Morstan and her employer, Mr. Mrs. Forrester, relating to them the facts of the case known to him so far. Upon returning to Baker Street, the landlady, Mrs. Hudson, tells him of her concern about Holmes's health, as he has been particularly agitated. In the morning, Holmes decides to go out to discover the Aurora himself. He leaves Watson as his representative at the flat, and Watson sees that Holmes has placed an advertisement in the newspaper offering a reward for information to help locate Mordecai Smith and his son Jim. Anthony Jones arrives in response to a telegram from Holmes. 
While waiting for Holmes to return, an ancient sailor arrives, claiming to have knowledge of Mordecai Smith, which he refuses to tell anyone but Sherlock Holmes. And after being persuaded to remain, the sailor removes his disguise and reveals himself to be Sherlock Holmes. He asks Jones to be under my orders when they go to arrest the culprits and says Jones will be welcome to all the official credit. And Holmes insists that the three of them have dinner together. And the quotations to remember for chapter nine are, this infernal problem is consuming me and was it not possible that his nimble and speculative mind had built up his wild theory upon faulty premises? Chapter 10 is titled The End of the Islanders. So after dinner, the three men set off in a police launch in pursuit of the Aurora. Holmes explains that he has realised that Mordecai Smith must have put the boat in with a repairer to hide it while the men made arrangements to escape abroad. Having located the shipyard, they follow the Aurora as it speeds away. The spot Jonathan swore at the stern, as well as his small companion. When Tonga raises a blowpipe to his lips, Holmes and Watson both shoot him and it falls into the river. Trying to escape, Small jumps off the boat onto the money banks, but his wooden leg sinks into the sodden soil. He and the Smiths are captured and Holmes and Watson locate the treasure chest. Returning to the police launch, they notice a murderous start and realise how close to death they had been. And the quotations to remember for this chapter are, individuals vary but percentages remain constant. Never did sport give me such a wild thrill as this mad flying manhunt down the Thames and his venomous menacing eyes amid the white swirl of the waters. Now, chapter 11 is titled The Great Agra Treasure. So the captured Small is given a cigar and a drink by Holmes, who begins to question him. Small tells the men that the key to the treasure chest is at the bottom of the river. Watson is entrusted to bring the chest to Miss Morstan. He tells her of the adventure they've had and presents her with the treasure chest. Using a poker from the fireplace, Watson opens the chest and they discover that it's empty. Without thinking, he exclaims, thank God. He admits that he loves her and now that her riches are no longer an obstacle, he feels that he can declare this. She replies, then I say thank God too, and Watson draws her close to him. Now the key quotations to remember from this chapter are, it seemed to me that there was more sorrow than anger in his rigid and contained countenance and whoever had lost a treasure I knew that night, I had gained one. Now the final chapter is chapter 12 and it's called The Strange Story of Jonathan Small. So Small dominates this chapter, recounting the events leading up to his imprisonment, his escape and his desire for revenge. He admits that he's thrown the treasure into the Thames since, if he couldn't have it, he wanted to make sure that no one else did. He tells his story starting with his days in Worcestershire, his enlisting in the army and then being posted to India. There, through an unfortunate encounter with a crocodile, he lost his leg. After a series of adventures, he found himself guarding an entrance to a fort where two Sikh guards convinced him to take part in a robbery and murder, organised by another Sikh. These became the Four in the Sign of the Four. They hid the treasure but were convicted of the murder. While in prison, Small assisted a doctor and learned new skills. He also overheard the conversations of the officers and doctor when they were playing cards and discovered that Major Sholto was in financial difficulties. He proposed that if Sholto helped Small escape, Sholto and his friend Captain Morstan could have a share in the treasure. However, he was double-crossed when Sholto stole the treasure and returned to England without fulfilling any of his obligation. Small used his skills to save Tonga's life, the small Aborigine who became his faithful friend, and they escaped to England together seeking revenge upon Major Sholto, and Small confirms Holmes's version of Sholto's death and is taken away by Jones. Watson confesses that he has proposed to Miss Morstan to Holmes's distinct lack of enthusiasm and the novel ends with Holmes returning to his previous boredom and reaching out for a cocaine bottle. And the key quotations to remember from this chapter are, we each held a secret which might have put each of us in a palace if we could only have made use of it. A fitting wind up to an extremely interesting case and love is an emotional thing and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. And of course, this is Sherlock Holmes' own words. So that's all. If you found this video useful, make sure you sign up for our Sign of the Four course where we'll go over the novella, its characters, themes, but most importantly, I'll show you how to write top level nine model answers for your coursework or exams. Thanks so much for listening.